heard a lot of comments tonight about happiness as being a bircher and it's a great time to be a bircher. I'm interested in this nickname bircher. We're members of the John Birch Society and I'm not even so sure that that bircher name wasn't given to us by our enemy. But we liked it. They can call us that. We liked it. Nicknames do have a, a way of sticking. I'm reminded of the, of the verse, Father calls me William, sister calls me Will, mother calls me Willie, but the fellers call me Bill. <laughs> well, we're known as Birchers, and I guess we could have been called a lot worse. Oh, boy. And I'm proud to be a Bircher. And I'm proud of my association with Birchers over the years. People who have been willing to stand tall. My remarks this evening, I would like to start with a few questions. Why is there a John Birch Society? Why is there a perceived need for patriots to join and work together? Why over the years have so many been willing to stand up for freedom and withstand the controversy associated with the freedom battle? Why is the society's mission so important? What is that mission today? What are its plans for the future? And why is it so important that Birchers seek out with such great urgency others to help, others like themselves, who also carry that spark of freedom in their hearts? Tonight, in offering at least partial answers to these questions, it's my hope to create a little better understanding as to why the John Birch Society has succeeded as an organization for the past 40 years and why it must continue to succeed even to a greater degree in the decades ahead. The struggle between good and evil has been with us since the beginning of recorded history. In most periods, there were those who would strive to order their lives along righteous principles, and there were those who would put their evil and selfish desires above all else. Historically, the same would apply to nations, kingdoms, and empires. Some were good, and some were evil. In those that were good, the people were generally free. And in those that were evil, the people were nearly always subjugated to misery, and slavery. Someone once said, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. There is a battle raging today. It is a war that has raged throughout the history of man. It is not only a battle between good and evil, it's a war, now as before, that could well result in the freedom or the slavery of the entire human race. So let's go back to the earlier questions. Why is there a need for patriots to join together, linking arms in an organized fashion? Why is there a need for an organization called the John Birch Society? It was Edmund Burke who reportedly said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. If the issue is really good versus evil, then is this not a religious issue? Is this not something that religious organizations, institutions, and affiliations are already dealing with? The answer to that, of course, is yes. Almost all churches are established for proper reasons. They generally express well the principles regarding personal salvation. They challenge their people to live worthily, to do good, and to avoid evil. But for the most part, the churches usually stay away from organizing their members relative to issues such as promoting national freedom or opposing the evil forces working to bring about international government and international slavery. The reasons for staying away from these issues are many. And if addressed, the reasons are usually justified one way or the other by the leaders of the various denominations. There is an obvious need for churches to do what they do. But there is also a demanding need for an organization which will provide leadership to patriots truly concerned about freedom. Our founder, Robert Welch, stated our role very clearly in 1963. Quote, 
that John Birch Society is not to any slightest degree a religious sect or denomination. It is a body of truly good men and women of all religious creeds and shades who are working together each in a spirit of tolerance of another's beliefs which implies no compromise of one's own. These men and women of goodwill, good character, and humane consciences are combining their labors and their sacrifices for certain worthy beliefs and purposes which we do all share in common under our Constitution as American citizens, following the path of basic morality and doing our utmost to sustain and restore a firm sense of moral values in our civilization is one purpose on which we all agree, unquote. Returning to our basic questions, what is the society's mission? What is it doing today? And what are its plans for the future? Returning to Edmund Burke, he said, the people never give up their liberties but under some delusion. Mr. Welch claimed that this statement of Burke makes clear in one broad sweep the duties and aims of the John Birch Society. For if we can show enough of our fellow citizens that they are being deluded, they will themselves offer effective resistance to the brazen and tragic robbery of their liberties which is now taking place. The John Birch Society is an educational organization. Our mission is to teach people the correct principles of freedom, to alert them and arm them so they can resist and stop the conspiratorial forces working to enslave mankind. The education and the action that must necessarily follow are often geared to correcting the incorrect perceptions which have been foisted upon us. An example, the prophet Isaiah spoke of our day when he said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah didn't say that darkness would be light or that bitter would be sweet. Nor did he say that evil would be good. What he did say was, Woe unto them that would put those absurd notions forward. Does today's daytime TV programming, filled with perversion and immorality, indicate that the entire nation is corrupt and degenerate? Or is it just, in Isaiah's words, simply put to us that way? Do movies, TV programming, magazines, and the lifestyles of many celebrities mean that all people have accepted promiscuity and perversion as normal? Or is it just put to us that way? The October 7th South China Morning Post, citing government sources, reported that the leadership of President Zhang Zemin is committed to maintaining proletarian dictatorship and an iron fist on dissent. So then, is it true that people living in despotic nations such as China are truly happy with guns pointed at their heads while they produce much of the goods found on the shelves of the retail stores today? Or is it just put to us that way? Is it true that overpopulation and global warming will bring about the destruction of our planet? And is it true that these and other supposed international problems will be solved if we are willing to give up many of our freedoms to become part of a United Nations global community? Or is it just put to us that way? And finally, equally preposterous as those previously mentioned, is the nonsensical absurdity put to us that Bill Clinton still enjoys a 60% popularity rating. <laughs> These and many more outrageous falsehoods have been constantly put to the American people. And the John Birch Society for 40 years has taken the responsibility to expose them for the lies that they are. <laughs> the
the John Birch Society, the magazine, the New American, its committees, TRIM, the Impeach Clinton Now Action Committee, and others have in the past and continue presently to give leadership by helping relatives, friends, neighbors understand these critical issues. Yes, we are an educational organization, but we are much, much more than that. The information and the awareness that we are talking about is to create an understanding that is essential to the survival of our nation and of all free people. For instance, how can we remain free if our people do not even know the basic principles on which our nation was founded? For the most part, the proper role of government and the greatness of our constitutional republic are subjects neglected in our educational institutions. Our people generally do not know what a great and marvelous system of government they have inherited. And just as damaging the American people are greatly propagandized regarding the state of the world and the atrocities being perpetrated, ignorant in their carnal security, they often boast that all is well around them. But not all is well. In the blue book, Mr. Welch wrote, the increasing quantity of government in all nations has constituted the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. Political scientist R.J. Rommel documents that governments have killed at least 203 million and perhaps 360 million people in the 20th century alone. This is not ancient history. This is not something long ago. This is in this century. Of the total, government in time of peace has killed at least 151 million, four times the number of battlefield deaths in all this century's wars combined. Our friends and our neighbors and our relatives and those we love would be alarmed and be willing to fight if they were hearing that, if they were learning that in their newspapers and on their news broadcasts and in their schools. But they don't. They're wandering in a carnal security thinking that everything's fine. It's not. Another fact, unfortunately, not noted by Romo is that the most murderous regimes, the Soviet Union, Communist China, the Khmer Rouge, Cambodia, Idi Amin's Uganda, were recognized as peace-loving nations while they were doing these things by the United Nations. Hmm. Because of the insight of Robert Welch, the John Birch Society has been consistently ahead of its time. For example, in the 1958 founding meeting, Mr. Welch assessed part of the strategy of the international communist conspiracy as follows. And a part of that plan, of course, is to induce the gradual surrender of American sovereignty, piece by piece and step by step, to various international organizations, of which the United Nations is the outstanding, but far from the only example. Today, many would agree with Mr. Welch's assessment of the United Nations. Thanks in large part to the educational work of our members, a significant number of Americans perceive the UN's role in a new world order as a serious threat to freedom. The relationship between education and freedom is not unique. Again, it was Isaiah who said a long time ago, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. It's that knowledge, it's that understanding that could have kept those people out of captivity. And it is that same kind of knowledge and understanding and willingness to stand up for freedom that can change it today. Forty years ago, Mr. Welch laid the educational cornerstone and built the foundation of an organization that was intended to help patriotic Americans work to ensure freedom for generations to come. Our plans... We, the heirs of the past, are simply to do all that we can to move this principle-centered organization more aggressively to the accomplishment of its mission. 
Mr. Welch's words in 1970 still challenge us clearly today when he said, what the public or a sufficient fraction thereof must be shown conclusively is, one, that there is a powerful conspiracy now eminently threatening to make all of us slaves in a one-world communist empire. Two, that almost all of the destructive forces that work around us are activated and controlled by that conspiracy. Three, that massive deception as to both personnel and purposes is at the very core of that strategy as well as the tactics of this conspiracy. Four, that a sufficient understanding of the methods, purposes, and progress of the conspiracy is the only thing that can head it off. And five, that stopping, exposing, and routing this conspiracy is worth whatever it may cost in labor and money and sacrifice and courage. The John Birch Society stands alone in carrying this message. And the only thing which separates us from winning this war is the size and reach of our organization. Again, Mr. Welch said, the solution is that simple, and the task is that important. The challenge for all of us is to wake more people, to enlist them, and to get them involved. It's a difficult battle. It's been going on with many in this room for decades. Normally, when we're fighting, it's a short little battle period of time. We were talking in our council meeting and General Gatz has said that the men in the front lines are out there usually about a year. Many have been in the trenches for decades. It's tough. We live in a world again where people can go to a movie or a television show and see a problem develop understood, combated, and stopped in 90 minutes. And at the end, the guys with the white hats always beat the guys with the black hats. It works nicely in the movies. But it doesn't take 90 minutes. It takes a long time. And it's a challenge because in staying in the trenches a long time, we get weary. But we mustn't. If there's one thing that's inspiring in coming to these meetings, it's in meeting so many young people who have been found out with just in the last few years. Young people, just like some of you when you were young in the early 60s and joined, who today in their 20s and 30s are exposed to our material. And that same spark of freedom is ignited in their hearts and they're ready to be patriots and freedom fighters in this great cause. Not everyone's going to have that spark. Not everyone's going to be ready. Not everyone's going to do it. Let's not be discouraged by those that aren't. It's okay. They're, whatever they're doing is wonderful things in many instances. We're not going to force them into a battle that they're not going to do. We don't need them, but we do need the others. We do need to do everything to keep searching, just as you know in your own hearts, those of you that feel that, that when that day came and you were ready to be in that fight, you knew it, and nothing could keep you from it. We are constantly working to find ways to increase our organization, to expose the organization to more people and to help our members in this great responsibility of gathering fellow patriots. In the next few days, all of you that are members will be receiving a letter announcing another program that we have a lot of confidence in as we're moving forward to really aggressively deal with this issue of growth and casting out a wider net to more people. I started with a number of questions and I hope that some of the answers have been helpful. 
There is a vital mission, a proud legacy, and a history-making future for this grand organization. Tens of thousands of wonderful, dedicated, and devoted patriots have made untold sacrifice of time, influence, and money to bring us to where we are here tonight. We are the heirs of ages past. We are the recipients of the blessings of those patriots who did so much before, those that we've rubbed shoulders with in this great battle, those that we revere, our founding fathers and other patriots throughout history. We have inherited what they fought, bled, and died for. They had a dream, and we have a dream. We're birchers. We're a brotherhood of patriots. I get chided a little for reading too much poetry, but I'll end with a verse you're all aware of. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood, this brotherhood, from sea to shining sea. Thank you very much.